also an economic historian by training and attempts to study the 18th century political economy of the Malabar coast. He is part of the ERC research project, NEEM, headed by Professor David Truman. His recent publications include Commercialization and Landed Proprietorship on the Malabar Coast in the 18th Century, published at the Indian Economic and Social History Review. Also, King, Kinglessness and an Oral Poem, Political Authority and its Discontents in Early Modern Malabar, published at the Krakow Indological Studies. May I please invite Shilakabha to share with us. Good afternoon. Namaste. So, first of all, I would like to express my sincere gratitude uh, to those who are part of Pradupi Foundation and those who are kind, and also with my friend Igal, who are kind enough to give me this opportunity. And I am also indebted uh, standing here to Dr. David Schulman. And uh, being, and I started my career. Uh, as an economic historian, a student of economic history, but suddenly in 2011, 2012, I happened to meet uh, David Schulman and uh, and I was traveling along with him, and he was always present in my academic and other cosmological careers, uh, and uh, was instrumental in, in, in inviting my attention to things which are unusual, which are standalone, uh, which are rare indeed. So today uh, I'll be speaking about uh, probably as an ultimate Arasika, because if political historians and cultural historians are Arasikas, the economic historians are, are more Arasikas, or the Arasika ultimate among the, among the group of historians. So today I'll be speaking about uh, a a text, Malayalam text, Vairagya Chandrodaya Sarasam Shepam. Uh, it is a Malayalam poem belonging to the Patil family. It explains the essence and strategic importance of Vairagya or the ideal of worldly detachment. This poem has been composed uh, in the mirrors of princess mode in which a wise swan, Hamsam or Aryanam, speaks to a late 17th century Travancore prince named Kottayam Keralavarman, who ruled from or who lived from 1645 to 1696. The poem captures our attention because of a peculiar choice of exposition and the arrangement of themes that it deploys for educating the king. Uh, they would help us to situate the poem, especially its craft and polemics, in the early modern standard of innovation in the realm of creativity and its attendant temporal dangers. The poem's strategy of narration underline a popular or a populist, by which I mean a non-pedantic reworking of the age-old ideal or the age-old and the highly philosophized ideal of Vairagya. This reworking, I believe, was part of a specific political project of Bheta Nirasam, meaning the rejection of all differences. For instance, the difference among human beings, the difference between mankind and gods, and the difference between Sthira and Chara entities. I would also argue that it was through this emphasis on Bheda Nirasam or Sadharmyam that the idea of Vairagya, particularly during the 17th and 18th centuries, found a new community of followers who formed a motley crowd and who frequently, uh, at least in the realm of political desire, had transcended their received boundaries. This poems, the poem's modality of employment reminds us of the South Indian poetry of the Niti or the pragmatic politics which at times, if we listen to the stories that Professor David Schulman and his collaborators had retrieved from the Naika universe, proved dangerous even to the Niti zone proponents and practitioners. The manuscript version of Vairagya Chandrodayam was available from the Herman Gundert collection of textual materials, materials shelved at the Tübingen University. It is titled Vairagya Chandrodayam and was collected probably from North Malabar in, collection, in connection with the early 19th century lexicographic investigations of the Basel mission intellectuals. 
The typical manuscript mentions the king Kerala Varman as its author, Idi Kerala Raja Varma, Idi Kerala Varma Raja Virajitam, and explains his title as Vairagya Chandrodayam Katha Sahaja Samshepam. The expression Katha disappears in the Government Oriental Manuscript Library, Madras Manuscript, uh, and it also misses the mentioning of Kerala Varman's authorship in the colophon. The first noted instance of printing Vairagya Chandrodayam was in 1889, published from the Vidyavivardini Press by Messrs. S. T. Reddyar and Sons Koilon. The printed version agrees with the, with the Tubingen entry on authorship and mentions the poem as a part to containing tidings of a swam, Hamsopadesham, and that it was found on an old palm leaf book circulating in several forms in the kingdom of Travangur. The GOML Madras version was edited by T. Chandrasekharan in 1954 and it contains 2723 verses structured in the Kilipatu meter Keka, even though the composition does not often agree with the Keka rhythm. This presentation is based on the GOML Madras version and the Tibetan manuscript, though I was not able to include in this rather initial note a detailed discussion of the part content. Rather, the att attempt here is to provide some thoughts on the background of this poem and its author, and also the context in which the history of this poem's manifestation was remembered in the oral part medium of travel book. In the end, if time permits, I'm planning to provide you with a brief summary of the themes that comes under the preview of Hamsopadesi. Vairagya uh, Chandrodaya Saira Samshepam and its other Kerala government have already attracted attention of Malayalam literary scholars, notably the early historians Pappu Pillai, Govinda Pillai and Ullu as Parimesh Raya. Govinda Pillai knew Kerala government as a three part poet known amongst the people and cited a small set of verses from Vairagya Chandrojyam which in his opinion was composed immediately after the Mughilapada event. We will see what Mughilapada event is. Uh, Parameshraya in his encyclopedic work Kerala Sahitya Chaitram provided a detailed survey of the poet's biography and introduced to us his part contributions such as Valmiki Ramayanam, Padala Ramayanam, Bana Yuddham, Bhishma Padesham and Vairagya Chandrodayam for a year uh, Kerala Varman's poetry, especially his rendering of language, introduces a style which is extremely simple and pleasant. Atramatram Lidigavum Prasannam. It does not agree, according to Ayer, with the instructions of the standard poetic meters and structural rules, including the Sanskrit grammatical case endings or vipakti. Kerala Varman kept them to a bare minimum, and the poetry in Vairagya Chandrodayam therefore often falls. Uh, uh, even to the, to the, therefore, often fails to follow even the elementary alliteration scheme, the Idi Ashra Prasam, which uh, it is good to remember here a necessary condition as per the part uh, definition found in Lila Tilakam. The poet had broken cases in the middle and verses which are unfortunately incomplete. The poetic intention, however, is overtly instructional and didactic, and in this sense, Kerala Varman anticipates as, uh, as if he constitutes a prehistory for the 18th century part to master and maverick Kalakat Kunjal Nambia. The idea that informs this poetic craft is, I hear, thus continues by quoting a poet in his own words to communicate the foundational story, Moolat Tilula Katha and its secretly vessels, Gudatilulla Purul, even to those fools who had no initiation into grammars of poetry and also, of economic, also to economic historians. <laughs> the poem uh, Vairaki Chandrodeyam is narrated as a conversation uh, in the Kiripato mode taking place uh, between a wise man, Rajahamsam, and a king controlling the land of Vanchi. Land of Vanchi. The expression Vanchi refers to the kingdom of Venadu or Travangu and the king because the poem addresses him as Kuralisan or the lord of Kurali is Veera Kerala Varman of Kottayam who ruled Travangur during the closing decade of the 17th century. Travangur's historians however say that Kerala Varman was only a prince regent or a proxy like assistant to Queen Ashudhi Tirunal Rani Umayamma Fatingal who was also known as Veera Iravi Avani Pillaya the first female ruler of Venadu. 
whatever be the case, Kerala Varman was seemingly adopted, if not invited to Travancore by Umayama when her reign and the kingdom of Venadu was plunged into a phase of instability. There were many claimants to the throne and the political situation was almost akin to Arajagam or the abominous state of kinglessness. Such a predicament was never foretold. The war home, the Pada leader of Akingal was falling into perils. Military defeats reigned over their side and the tiny Nair battalions had been threatened with extinction. These men had to live low in their, in their secluded homes. Uh, there were crises in the Patmanava Swami shrine too, interrupting even the daily offerings to the Lord. There were instances of fire, disorder and destruction. The people often spotted in auspicious omens, drops of blood and prowling serpents in the grand pagoda of Ananda Patmanava. For historian K. N. Ganesh, these happenings provided here I quote a, uh, a starting point for a dark pity, a turbulent situation that prevailed in the region during the turn of the 18th century. At this tensor, the fate of becoming the protector of the house of Vanji, the Vanji Palakan, uh, fell upon the person of Kerala Varman, who was deputed to live in a standalone palace at Narasinghadallu or Iranian, deep inside the southern rebel country. Kerala Varman might have felt lonely and hopeless, or what one could, what one of his early party characters, Lenka Ravana of Patala Ramayanam, Kilipati, felt of himself when his intimate army of Rajani Charaman were devastated. Bhuvanathalam, Adiloru, Bhuvanathalam, Adiloru, where Enno Uru Tulirai, Bhagya Hinarmar, Machai, Bhagya Hinarmar, Illamat Tayume. Sahaja Sudar, Amida Vala Mulla Sai Nengalum, Okke Marichu, Nyan Eda Kiyayadu. The countryside nobility of Venadu politics was fast switching sides, just like the untrustworthy Vibhishana, again of Padala Ramayanam. They were found making friendship with the enemy, Shatru Mitratu. Amongst them, treachery now became a customary practice. The prodigal grandees of the Pillamar syndicate were destroyed enough to join hands with the enemies of the kingdom. The Naiga state of Madurai and the Mulkigiri leaders or Sardars sent from the Mughal army frontier in the Karnatic Balaga. Travangu's oral repertoire belonging to the so-called Tekken party or the stories of Tamilized Bosons, New Kerala Burman and he and his incoming army men. The Pullavar poets called this army as Mugilapada, we mentioned earlier, and named their chief as Mian Dure. Uh, their country it was located somewhere above the ghats where Telugu meets Tamil. Telugu Tamil Serum Mian Dure Natri. And where nameless pathways make their run through secretive mountains. Pera Riyamal Kalamana Malavadi. The Pulavar poetry further remembers how Kerala government regained the hope and, and overcame the situation. He emerged from the palace of Renasinghamandu, uh, literally the town of the Lion King, and became successful in defeating one of those Sardars at the temple town of Tiruvata, where when a Mukila band of mercenaries mounted on horseback and descended into tra southern Travampur, into the plains of Tovale in Nanjina. If you consider the 18th century Prabandham Tiruvatar Mahatmyam an example, the Vishnu shrine of Tiruvatar was home to a Manipravalam based tradition of Stalagurana poetry. However, King Kerala Varman distanced himself from the Manipravala protocols and preferred Patu mode to win over the enemy with the help of the god of Tiruvata, the Lord Vishnu Adikesha of Pirumal, the slayer of Keshi, the host demon in Bhagavata Purana. The literary history credits Kerala government with the authorship of a Patu prayer, Adi Keshava Studi, which was sung for his victory over the great army of Mukilas who were not even afraid of death. Here, Kerala government, uh, the poet king Raja Kavi exhibits a commendable ability to express himself and he sings his mind in the medium of uncomplicated and rhyming part, which, as we see in a moment, uh, assumes the form of a desperate and aimful prayer of attachment. Oro vidha mayuda jalavu, oro vidha veshavu mandula, oro vaka vambata mrutipayam, oradena vichu verumbol. Kerala Varman's natal home was in the North Malabar Kingdom of Kottayam, which, as we have already seen, bore the appellation of Purali or Puravadi Nadu. He belonged to a royal family, he belonged to the royal family of Kottayam, known as uh, Kottayam. Known as Prakara Sarubam, the Kottayam royals cherished the memory of them belonging to a foreign Puravadi line of kingly Kshatriyas and therefore claimed a purer status than 
those who were to be met with in the lower, lower uh, the, the low country of Malayalam or the Malabar Pine Garden. Purali, Purali uh, for them was a totemic mountain. It was their Janapada, that says uh, the, the Vatni Ramayana of, of Kerala government. It was their Janapada and a guarded site of martial training, Kurali, where the Lord Shiva is permanently present. It was here that their ancestor, a Perumal king named Harishchandra, once kept his Rajadani and sent out a whole country, or sent out for the whole country the Bhakta ideals of Mimamsa system he professed. Purani, was, uh, ha Purani houses the war goddess Sri Portali and a mysterious waterfall known as Kumarathara, both casing boons and miracles, unforeseen military victories, and an overnight transformation of a foolish lad into a rightful poet. Scholars, poets, warriors, and mercenaries thus frequently travelled from, from the kingdom of Kottayam towards near and afar in all directions as if there was a trade in their capabilities. Kerala government, we could safely assume, belonged to this continuity. Historians, however, provide us only scanty details of his early life, except, that, except sharing with us the well-known story that he was a worthy descendant of a le very learned prince adopted to Kottayam from the royal house of Cochin or Perimbadam. The oral poem Puduvada Patil recognizes Kerala Varman as a nephew of Kodavarman, the ruler of Purani. Uh, he was born to Kodavarman's sister, Matumma and an arms uh, half Brahmin, Pandala, who happened to be her visiting husband. Another poem of the second part of the family, Kerala Varmaruda Katha, this dedicates the whole, a whole section to describe the, in the thickest manner usual to the part of composition, the extreme pain and penance, Arunta Pangal, that Madhuma had undergone to achieve the boon of childbirth, Makkapattivaram. Finally, she had Kerala Varman, the son, much desired for. But when he was barely a boy of barely seven, Kerala government approached his mother and posed a set of questions. Pandu mama nanda kalapile, kanaku gulu menge amma, kaivalu menge amma, paaya udamalu menge amma, vellani yu menge amma. Tell me, oh my mother, where are those account books? Where, are, where is the treasury, the store of wealth? Where is the heavy sort of fragrant order? And where is those? Where is the white elephant of those days past when my uncle ruled the country? As, as we would argue in this presentation, these questions and the concern they impart were instrumental in shaping the later courses of Kerala Varman's life, both in politics and also in poetry, including his composition of Vairagya Chandrodayam as an instructional text following an expressive template of the Nidhi literature. These questions strongly inform the Trumbull episodes during his kingly career in Venadu, as well as the mysterious turn of events leading to his death in 1696 by an event of regicide. In the meantime, the oral part to world, oral part to world, uh, in the oral part to world, world, the story of Kerala government does not end with his murder. Uh, instead, the oral part to credits him with a life after death existence. Interestingly, the oral poets of Travancore called his afterlife persona as Puduvada or the new spirit, perhaps highlighting the innovative novelty and also the unusual tragedy that his careers had represented. The pullover logic of attributing an aspect of newness or unusual to, the, to an unusual king had continued even the regional poetic routine. Uh, as we see, and we see the 18th century part of poet Ramakurthu Vaidya, hailing Travancore king Anirad Tirunal Matanda Varma as Navavataram, literally the new incarnation. For Vaidya, if we initiate an intimate examination between his lines, Martanda Varma's incarnation was not entirely new. Rather, it was a repetition of the Lord Vishnu's incarnation in Venadu as Naratari, the slayer of Hellish Asuras about 50 years ago. I feel that here the Pata poet Ramakrithu Vajyav is making a historic reference to Kerala Burman and, uh, and this reference attests uh, uh, the Pulavar reasoning of attributing him with a life after death existence. Puduvada Patil further documents that it was Kerala government's search for the past and its ambition to inherit its effects, the fiscal accounts, the physical wealth and the symbols of authority brought him into conflict with the Rajadors of his realm, resulting in his assassination of a key minister, Mantri, uh, of the kingdom of Kottayam. The royal mother, uh, Matumma, wanted Kerala government to expiate the sin of homicide by performing a pilgrimage. If the Keralapati story of Patamala Nayar, who was minister to Chairman Perumal, an indication, killing one's own minister is a pathaka with dangerous karmic effects. 
it can deter the slayer, the half portion of his moksha and the remaining half, the Padi moksha is only, this, only a distant possibility conditioned upon his leaving the country forever for, a, for an event and pilgrimage. Kerala Varman uh, had valid political reason however for committing for his committing of what could be better called the Mantiri side. Uh, but his mother Maduma paid no attention to it and the slayer ultimately bore the burden of expiating his own sin privately at work. Kerala Varman set out for a pilgrimage. The final destination of his journey was the powerful Tirtha baths in the island of Rameshwaram in the Marawa country of Ravanadu on the coast of Koramandam. The pilgrim had to travel through Travancore, where, as mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, the queue in Rani Kumayamma was in the midst of uh, many challenges. She was enmeshed in a venomous circle of enemies, and her young male child and heir, named Devi Varma, was too young to assume the royal gaddi. The pilgrim status of Kerala government had already been noted by K. M. Ganesh. Historian Mark Dillino even a step further with the help of contemporary dead sources and described. Um, uh, a set of rumours collected from Travancore by the VOC, the Dutch East India Company's trading establishment as Kolachal, the port town about four miles west of Iranil, where Kerala government had been assigned and about a palace by Rani Umayamma. It was in 18, 1681 that the queen formally adopted Kerala government into her house. The timing fits exactly uh, as uh, we have already seen the part in memory of Ramadur Kuvayya. Some say the pilgrim uh, was approved by the Kuwait Umayama as a son, but some others, notably the DOC and the Pilamar allies, claim that he was a lover with whom, here I quote, the Kuwait mother always wanted to sleep. Whatever be the exact preferences working behind the Kuwait's choice of Kerala government, the adoptee was certainly a fictitious king, a stranger to the line, not even a visiting husband as far as the in house members of the Bernard matrilineage was, were concerned. At the same time, it is important to note the prince had already been alienated from his natal home for Avadinadu almost permanently. An, un an unperformed pilgrimage and an unexpected sin of killing minister did not allow him to return to the home country. No one in fact waited for his return and expected his homecoming. Kerala government therefore lived in a nowhere space. In this sense, his state was almost akin to the fate of faceless Mukila mercenaries whom he had encountered and slew on the hillside of Travancore. In my opinion, at this juncture, there were three options that were that might have lain open before the King Kerala government. The easiest of them was to kill himself and put an end to the state of nowhereness and the unbearable misery of loneliness that it faces. Oral poetry, Uduvada Pate and Kerala Varmanada Katha, resolved this issue by taking this course and conclude the story in Kerala Varman's suicide. The second option of being meaningful to one's own in liminal existence was to compose a part approving the ideals of worldly detachment or vairagyam as if it was meant to instruct others. Vairagya Chandrodaya Sara Samshevam, perhaps a result of this trembler strategy and predicament. The opening verses in the Tubican manuscript and also the GOML Madras version summarize his intention as follows. Here I quote, the part is written, this part is written with an intention of giving rise to, a, rise to the moon of detachment. It was sung by a swan that stays in the mind of the king, Raja Manasa Vasa, Raja Manasa Vasa Hamsa. Uh, it is a liberating tale, Mojanam Katha, explaining the actual aim of all karma acts and enactments and therefore it is capable of, free, uh, capable of freeing a potential listener from the chain of birth or jenny. I think that the expression Raja Mana Savasa is of utmost importance because it, it, uh, it, it, it indicates that the Kerala government in the guise of Hamsam, the swan was speaking to himself or giving advice to himself on the virtue of detachment. If you could agree with me on this proposal, the whole Vairagya Chandrodaya Sara Samshepam would appear as a long monologue, uh, a self-help enterprise niched subtly in the southern Indian early modernity. Uh, the third and the final option was to fall victim to others who were equally disenchanted with their own states of existence. Perhaps the victim also has, uh, perhaps the victim and also the assailants were equally inebriated with the heavy, with the heavy dose of viral In the year 90, 1696, 
the Venard Prince, Kerala workman, was murdered by a close coitry of his own counsellors, the party Brahmins and the title book holding grandees. The swan flew away and the king's body lay exposed in the palace ground. Thank you. Abhilajat was um, so rich that it was a vision that I'm not sure where to begin and where to begin to disentangle this trance. But one thing that is very striking um, is that theme, which you have elsewhere identified as the um, early modern Kerala theme par excellence, namely the lonely political actor, the lonely king who has very few options, you listed the three of them. So that means I imagine that he must have composed the Vairagya Pandora before he was murdered, I guess. <laughs> but perhaps, uh, perhaps he felt it was going to happen, or perhaps he felt that there was no other option. And in that sense, it's really close to the story of the last Damrin, who actually did kill himself. Right? Yeah. That, right? yeah. And for similar reasons, if I think. Maybe you'd like to say something about that? Yeah, this, um, I believe that, especially along the coast of Malabar, the Kanara and, and the Malabar province, and so the princely state of Cochin and Travango, um, uh, the 18th and 17th centuries have to be uh, investigated in their own intimate terms. So we find this unusual happenings, uh, the last summary, the Lord of Oceans and Mountains, uh, once upon a time paid by Portuguese, and there are Portuguese, Arabs, Chinese, and who, who else? Uh, this, this king, whose family had a long history, perhaps longer than the Mughals, uh, the last samurai in 1766 committed suicide. And in the suicide, as we are known, when this Raja dies, there were many companions of honor, people who are Nilapurushas or Asanas, the Sahaja Sutas, and uh, uh, they are supposed to live along with the king. Uh, and we have uh, stories of people, companions uh, dying along with the king, both male and female, both soldiers and, 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 and ministers. But in the case of Samarin, uh, who, when he was dying, uh, committing suicide, uh, he died alone. Nobody died along with him. And it was in that sense, it was an anomic suicide. And then the different types of suicide, if you believe in the classification of the king, the altruistic suicide, anomic suicide, and anomic suicide is something when you feel alone in a crowd. So I believe that Samurin was feeling alone in a crowd, uh, alone in a situation, and this loneliness of Samurin or Kerala government is it's, it's very important because uh, Samurin died, uh, as far as the death documentation of that incident is true, on an, on an April 14, uh, 1766, on the day of Vishnu. It was supposedly a regenerative um, kind of ritual. But the same summary, two months before, if we can believe the autobiography of Vella, uh, Vella uh, um, um, it's a rare 18th century um, autobiographic history produced in Malayalam, in Malabar. So if you believe, if you follow the Vella's account, the same summary, uh, about 60 days before, had conducted this festival of Mamankam. And the Mamankam is a festival, it's a Navaratri like festival where hundreds of people or thousands of people used to, adapt, used to assemble in order to protect the king. And the, the question that we were asking, myself and David Sarah together was asking, where were this, this crowd who were around Samarin trying to protect himself by dying or getting, or by killing or, or, or getting killed in that post? So in, this, in 60 days, the king became lonely, alone. So this is actually, I think this is an unusual uh, uh, um, phenomenon. Maybe uh, one have to investigate what is the context in which such a loneliness is getting unfolded. So I think Kerala government and also this this whole Vairagya Kechanpodeya was one of the options. Uh, what, what, this, this Kerala government belonged to the spectrum of lonely kings of every modern.
and I also believe that uh, um, um, along the coast of uh, West Coast, uh, I'm not familiar with the East Coast, uh, East Coast has an altogether different story to tell. Uh, on the West Coast, you, you, you see that from the, the 16th and 17th century onwards, there is a phenomenon of a political phenomenon of questioning kings and substituting his presence with something else was emerging so profoundly that the kings had no other options but to but to get to commit suicide and get reinvented by Kaiburushi. So, so this was slightly a different situation, and it seems uh, it, it demands at least a thorough investigation, perhaps a re reinvestigation of the existing materials and also the historiography. Why the Hamsa is the medium for delivering this uh, monologue or soliloquy? Yeah. As opposed to some other creature or person? Yeah. Um, um, so there's a peculiar type of literature you, I think you all are familiar with, it. it's really part of a type of uh, poems and kathas. So, in, in, in at least as far as I know, as a kind of, um, um, uh, there's a belief among Kerala poets that uh, the telling poem is something. Because when they're telling poem or telling history is something which is potentially dangerous, and also predicting future is also future is also potentially dangerous. The, the whole uh, industry of uh, crafting a poem, uh, you inherit both this this the sins, uh, telling the history and also uh, uh, predicting the future. So they just want to um, uh, evade this sins, this dual sins, and you need a proxy and to to speak on your behalf. And normally they invite some some shuka or some parrot or some coil or some even some mayura or, or some other uh, you know mysterious uh, creatures and the hamsas they are um, supposedly living in in Manasa, that is somewhere in Chinese Tibet and they invite these creatures and they, these creatures will speak these birds will speak on behalf of the coil but the interesting thing about Kerala government and that it's because of this. This fear or this kind of uh, obsession with uh, their own craft or the fear uh, of their own craft that uh, uh, these birds are invited to tell the story. But in the case of Kerala government, I believe that this Hamsa is not an external uh, uh, agency, rather, uh, he stays within the mind of the king, Raja Manasavasa. And the editors of the text, the, especially the UML version, consider this as Raja Manasa as one who one who lives in the, in the, one who is coming from Manasas at a distant place. But I don't think Kerala government was in, was in a situation of inviting somebody from a, such a far distance to speak on his behalf. <laughs> is there a possibility that the Hamsa is the descendant of Varma used the Hamsa in the Hamsa Damayanti painting? Is there some connection you think? Could it be? Possibly, I'm, I'm not familiar <coughs> Kerala uh, uh, Revi Varma's uh, uh, work, but possibly these are the usual creatures. Oh. They carry your messages. Some whole lot of Sandra Shikabias were ferried through this medium of uh, these birds and uh, animals and the subhuman uh, beings. What was happening to the economy? for him to go into a suicide kind of a... Uh, uh, <laughs> 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 I got me of the kingdom, yeah, you know. You, Must you. have been at the great attack and so shameful for him. Yeah, um, thanks for this question. And uh, but in order to answer this question, I may have to become a more Arasika. <laughs> and uh, the one important thing about uh, the cost of Malabar was there was no land tax. Unlike the the Mirasi or the or the places where you have the press, medieval presence of a state, uh, a fiscal state like the Maika states or the or the Vijayanagara state, uh, along the coast of Malabar you don't have the presence of a fiscal state. Rather, you have states taking tributes but not tax. So why was the state was not able to take the take the tax? Take the uh, tax? 
because I think that the state was not able to impose this regime of taxation because the private proprietorship was so much, so much strong that the state had to compete with this private uh, properties or the gen means or the landlords. And, and landlords are called, also called as gen nation, the, the, the issuer of this property. So, so the state had to operate, state had to mediate its, the kings had to mediate their institutional existence, negotiate their existence uh, by taking into account the presence or entrenched presence, some of them were as old as the king. Uh, with this, with this entrance presence of the landed proprietors, and the 17th and 18th century, you see an unusual generalization of these private holdings. The Janma, the, 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 the it became an unusual, really generalized uh, uh, economic reality. So the king has to mediate. King has no other options when there are people, thousands of people. Uh, Kashivan was mentioning a situation in which every home had a king, every plot had a king, and every small hold had a king. So, if that is the situation, the, the so-called crowned kings or the mudimannans as they are called in, in, in the medieval Malayalam literature have no other options. So, either they have to write a vairagya. You know, this, I was discussing this point with narration, then he was mentioning that this vairagya speaking king, uh, uh, in the 19th century Kerala, you have, in Kochi in, in particular, you have an, an ideal uh, kind of image or a, a, a image of somebody called Rajashri. The king who abducted their throne. They, they constructed this Cochin uh, Shornu railway, and and he, after the completion of the railway line, uh, the Rajashi uh, wrote an autobiography and he abducted the throne. <laughs> and uh, uh, and this this I think that's this this the Rajashi ideal, the image of a saintly king or the image of a an austerite king, was uh, was was I, was another possibility perhaps a, a fourth possibility of uh, negotiating one's own compromised existence. Yeah, they were, you know, I, I think that by 1850, when this, this India company took over uh, this, these places, uh, it was, the Manabar was ceded to them and the two others, the Cochin and Shravangu, were tributary states. And suddenly the company realized that this king should be maintained as the kings of the parts. And then suddenly they, they, they redefined them or they had a collaborative attempt to uh, redefine themselves as a princely states. So they were under protection and they were under, under the subsidiary alliance. And it was this, this subsidy army which maintained and also the mercenary uh, army and also the subsidy for subsidiary forces which 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 maintained this uh, princely states and also the Anandabhatmadabha temple and its pressure. Thank you, thank you. Happy last question. It was a little more surprisingly groundbreaking than I thought. Uh, and uh, uh, all that is, I believe, is uh, it's a major breakthrough in the United States of religion, speaking out of the time of the period. Um, but could you speak about the relationship, how you imagine that between these uh, social economic realities and the genre, like the part two, how, how do you think it functions? Do you think he really wrote it, or rather it was ascribed to him and sung in some circumstances in his memory? How, how do you imagine the functioning of this genre as a consequence of this situation? Yeah, and um, for that purpose I may have to speak a bit more about the Patil literature. And Patil, as we understand this from Leela Tilakam, we have a very technical definition of Patil. Dramita, Angada, Sharani, Vakam, Vitukam, Vishesha, Vitukam, Patil. It's very specific. You need to have this peculiar alliteration, specific sound, Dravida sounds and specific alliteration schemes. So, but what we have in Kerala, this peculiar honor of part, I believe it as a meta expressive medium. So, on the one hand, you have this extremely literary, uh, grammatical uh, uh, text, uh, 
example, from most with the extreme precision as per the detection of the Ramsey rhythm and many of those, the Gelfin Ramar and many of those. But on the other hand, you have uh, this uh, anything, you have this uh, text like Vairagya Sandrote, Mahayaksha Masabhusavam, you have this whole set of Tulal Party, Pana Party, Mamam Kutaranam, n number of uh, forms which are known by the term party. And also you have another huge uh, set of uh, uh, songs or artistic artifacts uh, uh, which are oral in nature, which are remembered verses or ep oral epics in their, uh, if we can provide them a classification, they were also known as part. So anything which is uttered uh, um, rhythmically are known as part. And why these unusual characters or the unusual plots were uh, depicted in part is probably because the part became the became the affordable mode of expression. So you don't need to have uh, sort of a schooling uh, to enter into this expressive uh, routines of part. And if anybody or uh, anything can be put as a part. Interestingly, in Trabangu, uh, the, the term katha was often uh, 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 mentioned as a synonym of part. So it, not, it need not be in verse. It can also be in, in, in prose. But what matters is the rhythmical utterance. So you just have, you just need to introduce a rhythm and then you utter a rhythmical uh, uh, piece and it is part of it became affordable. So everybody, anybody, uh, uh, anything can be put into or packed into a part of There are part is written for part <laughs> Let's go back to Kerala Varman for a moment. He, if I understood correctly, he was a kind of adventitious arrival at the Maynardic court, isn't that yeah. right? Yeah. And so, so he came from the outside into this rather thick kinship relationship with yeah. its matro matrilineal yeah. uh, structure, right? Yeah. You want to say a little more about that? I mean, look what happened to him. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and what happened? Uh, Kerala, especially Bernardo, you have a very complicated uh, uh, lineage, uh, at least lineage system, at least in, in, in terms of intelligence. I won't call it as a lineage polity, but it's a polity, it's a state in which the, the, the access to state was uh, uh, mediated through your real or unreal, unreal lineage connections. So there were several matrilineal branches. Uh, the, the Kerala medieval polity or the medieval states in Kerala has this peculiar feature of growing by division. So they have divided, they branched out into so extreme. You know, when Iravadi Karve, when she came to uh, Cochin uh, for an anthropological investigation on matrilineage, she was counting the number of the kings that Cochin family at that point in time was housing. It was around 400. And, and an interesting thing, Iravadi Karve documents that n many of them, uh, they don't know each other. They don't have any relations like pollution or pulia. So they were completely strangers in that sense of, uh, com in, in, in common sense terms, they were completely strangers. So what happens in Travangu, this, they have this matrilineal, matrilineage uh, a mode of arrangement for political ascendancy and aspiration. Then you have somebody coming from further north of, uh, of Malabar and an upland the kingdom, the Kottayam, the Kottayutu, which is which claims a pure Kshatriya status because all Kshatriyas of Kerala are supposedly uh, 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 slain by Parishrama and uh, we, the Kshatriyas have to be come from outside in order to become the pure Kshatriyas. Uh, and then this this Puravadi family, the Kottayam family, they have this pure status and he, he came to uh, uh, Trabangur and uh, his coming to Trabangur, as I told you, was part of a pilgrimage and pilgrim, uh, I believe, is a nowhere entity. He has left his home and he had not reached his destination. Then he was somehow became inducted into Trabangur for a family and the Trabangur historians does not ex expand on Kerala government story because they are afraid of, uh, because the, the state manual writers, they are afraid of the status of their mother Q, Numea Marani. So the, this, he had a problematic relationship, very ambivalent relationship with his queen. And the members of Trabangu royal family at that point in time considered he, this king as a stranger. He was not even a visiting husband whom, with whom they can have some kind of relationship, but this was an adoptee. He was, he was an adoptee and that adoption was not accepted by everybody. And he was doing many unusual things that time. 
I don't have time to explain on, on about this unusual activities both in southern Travancore and so in the northern Travancore. Um, he was intervening in, in the temple administration and he was trying to introduce many changes and he was also negotiating with a group called the Marava, Marava Pada and he sent envoys to the Ramanad or the Tamil country and invited a group of post soldiers, mercenaries into Travancore and strengthened his power. And he did many things and because of his stranger status, um, he and he was natal alienated, he had this problem of natal alienation and he cannot go back to his home and he cannot bring any of his relatives to Travancore and he was all alone. And because of his stranger status, he had to face many problems uh, uh, and these problems eventually mounted and it ended up failing his murder and he was murdered on his private residence. He was an unfamiliar king. Yeah.